I'm Nick Gillespie with Reason Magazine, Reason TV, Reason Foundation. And uh, what we're going to do for tonight is we have uh, four great panelists who are going to be introduced by Reason's Education Policy Director, Lisa Snell. Uh, if you're in the uh, main part of the office, by the way, there's plenty of seats uh, back here if you'd like to join us and see the people in the flesh. Uh, but uh, Lisa Snell is going to introduce everybody. Then we're going to have a uh, kind of quick conversation going over three basic questions. One, uh, what excites you the most about the school choice movement? Uh, second, what is the biggest obstacle that seems to be in the way of furthering school choice? And then finally, what uh, we're going to ask the panelists, what do they imagine or what do they envision or hope to see educational choice looking like in 2020? Uh, so uh, before we get started, I want to thank uh, all of the people and all of the organizations that are participating in National School Choice Week, which is a nationally coordinated attempt to raise the visibility of both the uh, meaning and possibilities of school choice to help create better educational outcomes, a better society, better life for kids, for parents, for local communities all over the country. Without further ado, here's Lisa Snell to introduce our panelists. Thanks, Nick. All right, well, thank you guys so much for joining us to celebrate National School Choice Week, and this is actually the kickoff, so you guys are at the very, maybe not the very first event, but one of the first events. And it's my pleasure tonight to introduce, first of all, it's appropriate to start with Virginia, Virginia Walden Ford, because she can really be called the big sister of school choice in Washington, D.C. She's largely responsible for the school scholarship and voucher program here. And really, Virginia is school choice week. She is school choice week. Secondly, we have Rebecca Huffman. And Rebecca works for and is the head of the National Association of Charter School Authorizers. And we have over 4,000 charter schools in the United States now serving more than 2 million kids. So charter schools have had huge growth. And at this point, it's really about quality. How do we ensure that we have quality choices for kids? And Rebecca does that work, and she's awesome. Next, we have Patrick Byrne, and Patrick is the founder of Overstock.com, and he has been a huge supporter of school choice in the United States for years. And then on the end, least but absolutely not least, <laughs> last but not least, <laughs> sorry about that, we have Joe Trippi, and he is a Democratic political strategist, and he is most well known for the Howard Dean campaign. Thank you guys all for engaging in this conversation tonight. I am the pinata. <laughs> no, that's uh, later on here. Yeah, that's later. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, without further ado, Virginia, why don't you kick it off and uh, tell us what is, uh, you know, as we uh, go into National School Choice Week, next week, what, uh, you know, what is exciting you the most about the current state of school choice? You know, I've been around a long time. I think this is about my 16th and 17th year just working in the school choice movement, starting with charter schools, and I mean, I believe in all choices. Uh, what's excited me is the numbers that have grown so much. So many more people are having a conversation about what can we do to make sure the children are educated in the best way possible? Uh, years ago, we didn't hear those kind of conversations. It seemed to be kind of the best kept secret in America. Not, let's don't talk about you know how bad the kids are doing. And now, over the years, we've seen those conversations grow, but not only the conversations, we see action. We see wonderful schools opening up. We see kids actually graduating and, and going on to college and, and, and finding a way to be successful in getting the American dream. And uh, I tell, I'm a, kind of a storyteller and, and I know I have other panelists to move to, but you know, one of the things that makes me excited among all of this, with all the conversations, with all the schools, with all the programs, is um, uh, an email I got just as I was leaving the house tonight. And this email was from a student who is a sophomore in um, biochemistry at Syracuse University, a young woman, who was an Opportunity Scholarship recipient here in DC, and who writes me every once in a while, or emails me every once in a while to say, Miss Virginia, I'm doing great. And who can tell you from the bottom of her heart that had it not been for a chance to go to a school that best served her, then she would not be at Syracuse 
in biochemistry and do them well. Just make sure, uh, Rebecca, make sure your mic's on and uh, have at it. What, uh, what excites you the most? There's a lot of things that are exciting me right now in the school choice movement. Um, how cool is it to see Michelle Rian Oprah, right? And really uh, talking about the crisis in education in a real meaningful way. Um, I couldn't think of a better message to messenger approach on um, marketing this issue because I think um, one thing that we've failed horribly in in the school choice movement is really getting the right um, uh, people and messages out there um, where it's been seen as this right wing uh, white man pri trying to privatize the education system. Watch and then you have, then you have uh, Michelle Rian an Asian woman mother of two going on Oprah and then we should, that, so that's exciting to see that there's uh, you know that when I'm getting my hair done that the lady's talking about did you see Oprah and that I didn't know things were well you know these teachers and so it's changing the normal grocery salon you know uh, debate around education um, the second thing is um, there are more that, that we're about next is about to release this this fax report around charter school authorizers and um, nec next week and one thing that we a key finding is that in the last three years there has been a 37 percent increase in school districts that are authorizing charter schools now what does that mean that school districts are coming around to the fact that they need to have more public school choice options in their portfolio so that's exciting at a rate of 78 new authorizers every year for the last three years so that's exciting and the last thing is the fact that we have hundreds of thousands of charter school alumni of school choice program alumni privately funded publicly funded voucher programs that they're either graduates of college or they're in college right now and they are voices saying you know what school choice works and um, you know we're gonna have a rally in Chicago next week um, at CPS and there's a lot of there's a busload of alumni of charter schools that are gonna be there saying you know what you need to vote yes on these 10 charter schools that are before you Thank you very much. Patrick? A <clears throat> couple things excite me. Uh, one is that I believe the data has gotten incontrovertible at this point on the success of school choice uh, and voucher programs or whatever your, your brand is. Also, it sounds a little cynical uh, because it's not a good thing, but what excites me is the state fiscal crises. Obviously, that's a bad thing, but the entire state fiscal crises as I've been explaining for about a year, and I think some of you saw me at Cato, the entire state fiscal crisis can be eliminated if every state adopted vouchers, and about 20 to 25 percent of children took it, this entire hole we're in goes away. Now, we're letting prisoners out of prison in California, uh, although there may be other good reasons to do that, for many of them. Uh, we're letting prisoners out of prison in California rather than let kids have a choice. So it takes about 20 or 25 percent of children to take a voucher and you would eliminate the entire state fiscal crisis. So as horrible as it sounds, in a sense we're getting to this, this uh, the, f the finances are, may, may drive us through the tipping point we've been trying to get through. Now to the trippy point. I, you know, I, I actually think uh, the thing that excites me the most is the expansion of the conversation. I mean, what School Choice Week, for instance, about really, and the reason I'm here is to to expand the conversation about what we can do to improve education and make a difference for our kids and get more competitive, uh, get get more kids into a, into a, a path to a, a future uh, that helps the country and themselves. And um, that conversation has to include everybody. And, and I think can't include any, can't be one option over any other. It's a, it's a real discussion across the ideological spectrum about what we need to do together as Americans to to get the country our children um, the best future and uh, that I, one thing that not popular that I'm going to say is that I believe that includes trying to get the union involved in the conversation which I know like ah but is I, I believe like everybody has to be involved in that conversation if they don't want to participate that's their, you know, that's their, but they need to be invited to the table. And I think that's what I like about School Choice Week. It's really about inviting everybody into the conversation across the political spectrum to join together as Americans about what we need to do to give our kids a better future. And, uh, and that's why, that's the thing that excites me the most. People who don't want to come to the table and have that discussion, nothing I can do or anybody else can do about that, but that there's a real opportunity now 
to get that discussion going everywhere in the country and letting citizens in particular, regardless of what's happening at the top, teachers, citizens, parents coming together, having that discussion. That's what really I think is excites me about, about what's going on right now. Thank you, Joe. Uh, for the second question, we'll mix up the order a little bit. Patrick, why don't you start off by uh, talking about what you see as the biggest obstacle to progress in the uh, broadly defined school choice movement? Well, frankly, I think it's the, I wouldn't even say the union Joe just talked about. In fact, I do think, we agree on an aspect of this. I don't think we should think of the union as being the problem. We should think of the guild as being the problem. And the guild is doing what guilds have done since the Middle Ages, well, since, since the Roman times. They're, they're just trying to set up barriers and extract monopolist rent. And it isn't just the union. It's remember that behind the school, behind your local high school, there's all these layers of bureaucracy you never see. There's the district, the county, the state, and the feds. Now, when you attack them, they trot out the teachers and say, oh, you, you don't like this. But, you know, there's $344,000 going into the system. For, and the t cost about $80,000 to put a teacher, pay her benefits, put her up, rent a classroom, and so forth. So there's $264,000 going missing somewhere between what she's getting and how much is pouring into the system. So uh, that's the guild. And it's really a mistake to just think of that as the union. It's this whole, this whole system. So I think, you know, no reason to even be mad at them. They're just the monopolies doing what monopolies are supposed to do. That's the whole point. Business guys try to get monopolies to do exactly what it's doing. There's no point in cursing the monopoly. There's point in breaking it up. So I think that the, the guild is the biggest, uh, inclusively understood, is the biggest opposition to progress. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, Joe, do you want to uh, go next? What do you see as the big obstacle? Look, what I think is the great obstacle to just about everything, including both political parties and, I mean, in just about everything that we've got is the systems become clogged up. And it's the system. I mean, it, I, in one sense, it kind of agree about the guilt kind of concept is that the system is just so, like, entrenched. It's really not the t it's It's really not even the union. It's all operating under a system that's just, like a bat, like the battery cables that don't quite work because they got all that stuff all over them, and you know, and, um, and that it needs to get. We need to revitalize it and and change it, even if it's just to clean all that stuff up, and find you know and, and put new cables on. I mean, it, something has to change. How we come to that conclusion in this society, um, I think it, 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 the only way to do that is from the bottom with people who parents, teachers, um, people in the community coming together and trying and pushing more decision making to the local community um, and, and trying to get, get people to participate in a new and different way because right now we've all been sort of, a lot of Americans have operated under the, well the rusty cables still sort of start the engine, yeah it cranks you know for a long time and maybe every once in a while it doesn't quite start but it, it does and and so I can go on and worry about everything else um, now we got to start people have to start participating start really thinking about this you know the wake-up call has to happen now what changes then that, that's what we need to talk about what are what's the right change and how's that happen uh, Virginia why don't you uh, take a shot at it you know I, I, I actually agree but what I see I, with what you're saying, I do think that we have to clean up the battery so we can, you know, get, get it go really going. But what I see happening in the community a lot of time is a lot of misinformation. Uh, you know, when we're trying to get parents out or trying to get parents to advocate on behalf of their children, you know, they've been told one thing and, and we have to try to clear it up, but, but, but then they look at us and, are we the enemy? I mean, are we telling them the truth or is somebody else telling them the truth? So I think what we have to do, I think one of the biggest obstacles in this country is everybody's talking and nobody's listening. And we have to figure out a way to get on the same page. And, and the bottom line, and I've been saying this for years, is everybody's got to stop thinking about 
themselves and start thinking about who we're fighting for. You know, I am never unclear about why I do this, ever. I do it for children. I do it for my children and your children and everybody else's children because ultimately, if we don't figure out how to have a have a, the same page conversation or or put aside our differences or stop being self-centered about what we do and what you do and and uh, let egos get out of the picture then we will never figure out how to educate kids. And that's what it's all about, you know. You know, I've said, somebody said to me today, well, you, you, you say you support everything. I do. I support quality education. I don't care how it's given. I, I, I want kids to be in educational environments that really, truly work for them. And until we can, you know, have a conversation and people's opinions don't get in the way, you know, I mean, I have a lot of respect for other people's opinions, but sometimes, and especially in this conversation, it gets in the way sometimes. And if everybody would just start concentrating on who we're doing this for, it's something, and, and, and this is something I tell the parents that I organize in D.C., I say, okay, take a picture of your child with you, put it in your pocket, and when you get tired and frustrated and angry and and want to just give up, pull that picture out and look at it. I carry a picture of my kids. Um, and and so sometimes I just want to scream to the whole school choice movement, the power brokers, the, you know, the folk that, that are leading the charges, I want to scream to everybody, put a picture of your child in your pocket or your grandchild or your niece or your nephew. And when you start getting um, your ego starts getting in the way or you cannot listen to what's going on, pull that picture out. And that's when, until we figure out how to do that, we are going to continue to have these fights and continue to have these arguments. And those are going to be the things to stand in the way of us finding, putting children in quality education. You stole my answer. Yeah. <laughs> You stole my answer. It was about message. No, I, that's okay. Um, I, I, I was to piggyback what you're saying. I just think that uh, we need to continue to tie the right message to messenger. Um, you know, the Dick Morris's in the, of the world going on Fox talking about this being a fiscally responsible, you know, approach that sort of thing. That's a very appropriate for that target audience. But when you're talking to parents, when you're talking to the beneficiaries of school choice, it has to be about this being the social justice issue of our generation and it being about our kids and so um, and, and I honestly think that it, it, this might not be in the, in the category of biggest challenge but most uh, we're at the miss the most the, the largest missed opportunity is the fact that we have hundreds of thousands of alumni of school choice programs that are not being educated uh, or engaged about, hey, you're a product of school choice. Come back and advocate for this. There are hundreds of thousands of kids on waiting lists to go to the types of schools that you went to that got you to go to Stanford and Oberlin and Pomona. So um, I just think that being able to engage the youth, um, especially looking at the civil rights movement when we look at lessons learned, I mean, there were youth organizations and student group organizations at universities that really pushed and was the fuel and the fire uh, for the civil rights movement, we don't have that equivalent in the ed reform sector. And I think that would be the biggest missed opportunity that we have. Thank you. Uh, let's uh, talk, Joe. Uh, it's 10 years down the road. What, uh, what would be the best outcome for uh, the school choice movement? Well, I'm like with Virginia. I don't really care what it is as long as we've succeeded in finding a way to, to to fix it, to have our kids being educated, given the best future possible. I mean, we, it, it's insane with all the, t just when, all the technology we have, Kindles, iPads, the whole thing. W you know, it, look at a teacher um, who's got to come in and hand out, you know, a book that's obsolete. I mean, from the, it was obsolete the day it got printed. And, and, and we haven't, even within the school board, haven't changed just that, just that simple thing of how do these kids who are, who are like, like so instantaneous to the information flow that's coming across every minute are being handed books that, you, you know, that, that, like I said, are dead trees. Um, and, and, and we're just stuck in that. When do we fix that? Just, I mean, would be a actually pretty simple thing for a school board to do, um, but how do we get get you know get that 
kind of, that's what I meant about the corros the corroded kind of rusted up engine. The, it's not anybody's in a lot of ways. I'm, I'm, there's no one you really want to go blame anybody. It's just hey, wake up. We can't even get kids books that aren't obsolete. How how do you maintain the status quo? How do you maintain that status quo? How do we all at least recognize that's something we need to change? Like yesterday, we have the technology, it's there, the ability to do it, um, and yet we still are like kind of like sleepwalking kids through, here's the dead tree. I mean, it's just not the way, not the world they live in anymore. Just that one change, how do we get that? That and many other things, but that's just one that, that sort of strikes me as kind of obvious, uh, particularly like as somebody who pioneered the Dean campaign. I mean, all the new stuff that we've been able to introduce to politics, to journalism, but on, can, on, on schools, it's the same, you know, the same, oh, there may be a computer lab. Give me a break. I mean, I mean, it's just not real, and how do we change that? Thank you. Patrick, what's uh, your vision, Education 2020? Well, I think what's going to happen is we're going to get a breakthrough in a few states. And we may be there right now. And then once we get the bre that breakthrough, my goal is to, is to protect it. And which sounds like a more conservative, uh, to conserve it, which may be more conservative in this audience sounds like, or is used to, but I think the time then becomes our friend. Once we get a few good universal or close to universal programs, time becomes our friend. We just have to defend them. Time takes, you know, the, the data starts proving itself. You get, a, you get a South Korea or an Asian tiger in Indiana or Oklahoma or something. And then, then the problem will, I think, take care of itself very quickly once there's a good a couple good demonstration effects it'd be nice if those were if in a couple states or a few states which had very demographics and problems i agree with joe uh, so I, I think that we're going to get sort of a stair step and then it's it will and we may be getting that first step th right now like in the next few months in a few state legislatures then it'll take two or three years to prove itself and then then the monopoly fails. I agree. It, by the way, I have a lot of respect for Joe. I think Joe brings a great tone of civility and perspective to the conversation. Don't agree with everything he says. Um, but his points about innovation. I are, like Pat, too. Well, Milton used to say that this is the only industry or that you could think of where it basically hasn't changed in 150 years. Somebody could come from 150 years ago and look at what people were doing and recognize it immediately. Not many other occupations are really like that. But there's not been, there's been few occupations where there's been so little innovation. And again, I think there are deep-seated reasons for that. There's no incentives to innovate. Could you, uh, before Rebecca gives us a glimpse of the future of education, what are the states that are most likely to uh, have this breakthrough that you're uh, hoping for? Well, Robert Enloe, are you here? Yeah. Should I, uh, I don't want to flash any hole cards. Should I keep this to myself? What are the states where we might see some breakthroughs quickly? I'm hoping we'll see Indiana pass a fairly nearly universal bill that covers 66 to 70% of kids. Indiana, South Carolina, Sa South Carolina and Oklahoma. Great, thank you. Rebecca, Education 2020. Arizona, sorry, Arizona. Oh, Arizona. So I live in a really interesting environment in, in the city of Chicago. We have a mayoral race, and there hasn't been a mayor's race in a while um, with, with Master Daly. I mean, Mayor Daly. Um, <laughs> he uh, has been a great mayor, by the way, with his mayoral control of the, the Chicago public schools. That's one thing that we have in Chicago that's really unique, in, uh, as it is in New York. Um, I think we're going to see more cities, um, big major school districts, having mayoral control. Um, we have a candidate in um, a, 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 that has a good chance to beat Rahm Emanuel, which is surprisingly enough, who included in his education platform that uh, vouchers.
abuse are included of it, that money will follow the child in, in, in chronically failing schools, um, as well as expansion of charters and that sort of thing. So I think that we're going to see more of that, more mayoral control of school districts. And of course, at the rate that we're going right now, with so many authorizers coming into the fold, more charter schools. And the investments in charter management organizations that are performing really well with underserved students is just going to continue to increase. So um, that's you know what I see, more mayoral control, because really a lot of the reason why the bureaucracy acts the way it does is because a lot of people are afraid of losing their their elected positions and they're afraid of losing their jobs well with mayoral control you know a lot of that could be mitigated thank you and Virginia well, since my panelists have given me such incredible hope what I'd like to see happen in 2020 is that every parent is able to choose what is best for their children where their children can best be educated what is going to what will be in the best interest of their school and that's going to incorporate everything everybody said uh, and a lot of work and a lot of us that are going to continue to fight as long as we can walk so that's what i'd like to see i, I want to see all of those kids uh, that ha have so much potential and have the, all those sparks in their eyes that we're seeing through school choice programs. I want them to continue to, uh, to have those sparks. I want their siblings to have them. Uh, so in 2020, I'd like to wake up and every child is in the place they should be and getting the, the education that they deserve. All right, thank you very much. Let's have a hand for our panelists before we uh, turn it over now to uh, questions. Uh, let's, uh, let's take some questions from the audience and please wait for the uh, microphone to find you and then if you could stand up and uh, identify yourself and uh, whatever organization you may or may not represent, if you want to falsify your identification, that's fine. <laughs> Just say it on the record, please. So we'll, please, we'll start over here. Please be gentle with me. Hi, uh, Brian Maxwell from the Cato Institute. I'm just wondering what everybody's thoughts are on um, the idea that there's a, there's a difference between charter schools and voucher programs. And the idea that you were talking, uh, Patrick, about the guild. And it seems like that the guild is getting behind charter schools in a way that they're still regulated and still approved and you know this sort of thing, whereas actual vouchers, uh, you know, dare I say, for-profit schools um, in the future may be swept aside by, inclu you know, by not distinctively separating those two things. And uh, if there's a risk that uh, voucher programs may not happen um, if, the you know, if the institutions get around this idea of charter schools. Okay, and uh, if not everybody, I also want to uh, bring Lisa Snell into the mix here from uh, Reason Foundation. Uh, but uh, if uh, would somebody like to uh, take the lead on answering that? You know that that certainly because a lot of people identify me as is working you know on behalf of the DC Opportunity Scholarship Program, the voucher program here in DC. But I mean I support charter schools as well. But that is a concern of mine. You know, for the last five years, six years, we've had kids in um, voucher program in charter schools and. Uh, and it's been really successful. Parents have been able to choose the school that fit the child and the program that fit the child. And, uh, and, and so that is a concern of mine. I, you know, I believe that parents ought to have some control over the money they spend for their children's education. So I am a big supporter of vouchers. And, uh, but because charter schools have now gotten the okay from the administration. So now charter schools appear to be uh, separating themselves from the voucher movement, and which I think is just wrong because I think that all of these programs benefit kids and I think we need to have them all. So it is a real concern of mine, so my, my voice will be loudly heard over the next few years. I will be working with states that are are uh, implementing voucher programs as, as in any way I can possibly work with them. I will be encouraging people to look at tax credit uh, legislation for scholarship programs and because I think there's a place for all of it and I am I started out with charter schools, you, you must know that, and in and, and educating charter school parents. So I believe that there's a place for both. I mean, for, it has been incredible to be able to 
tell parents you have all these choices in D.C. And I'd like to see that happen everywhere, but it is a, certainly been a concern of mine recently that everybody's jumping on the charter school bandwagon and kind of leaving the uh, voucher group alone. Well, speaking from the charter, I'm currently working in the charter school sector, um, used to lead an organization, a Hispanic-based organization, Creo, that advocated for vouchers as well. I do think that the voucher uh, sector has helped move the charter sector because I've seen it on the ground where legislators will be like, well, we don't want those crazy voucher people to get their way. We want, you know, charters are more politically correct, right? The union's not going to hurt me as much. So that's a reality. It really is. But um, I, I, I think that... Um, this goes back, and this is probably because I'm a marketing background major, is it's really important that we cloak this message of school choice around all the options. Um, that's the beauty of National School Choice Week is because I have never, I am like so shocked, pleasantly surprised, excited, I want to do backflips, that the fact that all these organizations that have partnered and signed on to be in for National School Choice Week is from the broad spectrum. And I think that's just going to help where people say, well, this voucher stuff, school choice stuff is just in just these little places here and there. It's everywhere. And so that's exciting to me that we can, you know, change the messaging to be more inclusive of all the options. And, and um, you know, I, I just think that the charter sector, it, it, on, the, on the other end, too, we're not out of the woods yet as far as the opposition with unions and all that. Um, it is amazing to me that after uh, I led a panel discussion after the screening of Waiting for Superman in Chicago and right out the gate when I opened it up for Q&A it was a public school versus charter school discussion well they're stealing money from the public schools and that and it, you, you would have thought you were back in the 1990s I was just like are you kidding me um, so uh, you know and you have the efforts of the unions trying to unionize charter school teachers I mean so there's uh, I wouldn't say that the charter schools is a love you know the, the beloved child of, of, of the unions. I mean, it, we still are not out of the woods yet as far as our opposition, so. I'll be quick. I do fear the conversation degenerating into the People's Liberation Front of Judea and the People's But I think of there as being a continuum. The first step is backpack funding. You go to any public school you want and the money goes with you, like Oakland. The next step is charter. And then I see tuition, tax credits, and vouchers as, as being the, nec the next step. I'm a voucher guy, or I'm, s I'm almost indifferent between ta tuition, tax credits, and vouchers. I like the simplicity of vouchers. But I think that we should all be reinforcing each other. Mm -hmm. And everywhere I go, I say, hey, charters is absolutely a step in the right direction. On Wall Street, they'd say it's directionally correct. I'm not sure I always see the reciprocal support from the charters towards vouchers, but that's okay. <laughs> but it's kind of funny to me. There's been something missing. If you look at Waiting for Superman, for example, I went to one a screening of that, and there was a, a you know, big conversation afterwards. The whole movie is about choice. Which child gets a choice? Which one gets a choice to go to a charter school? Which one wins this lottery and gets a choice about a charter school? But nowhere does it punch through and sort of make the conceptual leap to say, well, the goal, the, the issue is the choice, is choice, once people have the choice. So I don't understand people who sort of get on that spectrum. If they understand that getting on that continuum pushes things forward, why don't they make the leap of going all the way and saying, well, let's give everyone a choice? Because uh -huh. the opposition has done a great job of, of positioning vouchers as, you know, uh, uh, just They've done a great job of marketing our movement, unfortunately. And that's why I'm excited that, that we're able to be in a position because of all these films, not just Waiting for Superman, but the cartel, and, and all these incredible films that are shining a light on the crisis, is, is we need to be setting the messaging now. I mean, because the messaging thus far has been, you know, I mean, as a Latina going into the community saying that I support vouchers, is like, are you kidding me? Like, are you with those right-wing white men, you know, rich Republican guys? And I'm like, Okay, I look nothing like them, okay? No, but I'm just kidding. Not as bad enough. But, you know, I'm, I'm with them. I, philosophically, I'm with whoever is going to support our kids having the best access to the best education. And so I, I just think that this whole, we've totally missed the whole marketing piece, and, and, and it's ours right now with the, the climate of the, of, of the messaging around school choice um, for us to turn it around. Joe, did you want to uh, add anything? Yeah, I mean, I look, I think a lot of this is kind of, again, talking past each other in a little bit. And I'll give you an example. If I were the union or giving them advice, it'd be 
go start a for-profit school, get teachers in there with Kindle textbooks, and prove it's not teachers, it's not the teachers in the union, it's the system that's busted up and not working. I mean, prove, prove it the other way around to, uh, to everybody. I mean, because then, in other words, they want, va why wouldn't you want vouchers then to let your teachers get into a system that works, works better? But go prove that you can do that. And, and they, I think, personally, I think they could. Because I, I, I think it is, they're part of the corrosion too. I, don't, I mean the corroded uh, battery thing. But get out of that thinking for a sec. Start your own for-profit school and, right. and prove it. I think would be, you know, uh, 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 something positive uh, that we could all kick around and go, wow, that's, that's interesting. Why, you know, they could be the ones that prove the right system that would work. But, uh, you know, again, we got to get open to letting other, everybody come to the table and be open to that. Joe, uh, by the way, how can you tell us how much Amazon is uh, paying you to keep talking about Kindles, which are uh, coming? Although I think no, no, no. But I mean, and, and I don't could overstock outbid them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but, uh, I'm just using yeah. that as a no, point, yes. as a yeah, point no. of reference. That and it's one actually thing everybody could agree yeah, on. Yeah, no, and that's. Stupid. I mean, it's fascinating to think about. Uh, you know, textbook costs are things that school districts are always complaining right, about. And would. here's here's a very easy fix which just you know even if, if you bought them in bulk at list price you'd be saving money well and yeah. like if you have an economics book that what what ended with the great depression or something i mean what why not have stuff that's happening now yeah. be appended onto that that kids can they know what's happening now add that in into the curriculum to let them backtrack back and forth between friedman and and you know Keynes or whoever you know whatever the theory is that you're teaching all of them how do the how does current day fit into that there could be a textbook that's literally current and sort of more much more exciting because it's alive with them and said uh, you know that's I, all, I mean i don't want to get into it but that's like clearly has nothing to do with education yes. so yeah, that's yes. uh, that's something yeah. we uh, all remember uh, let's I, go to the I remember back here could you exciting, could actually. you come up and uh, ask your question becky please. she was really Hi, so I actually had a question. I definitely support students having the best option no matter where that comes from. But some of the things that I've read are that in certain communities, um, perhaps with school vouchers, that has almost created a segregation, like a going back to segregation of schools. So I guess I just wanted to get your opinion on how great I, I you're like I have an answer so I guess just you know how does school vouchers and school choice support um, low-income students and that sort of thing Could you identify yourself? sure um, my name is Julie Daniels and I'm actually with the women's campaign forum but just here personally so Thank you. Uh, let's uh, bring Lisa Snell into the uh, question and answer here Lisa do you want to uh, take a first swipe at that so that's kind of the straw man I think against the school choice movement I mean, to date, we have never had a universal voucher program that serves higher income kids. Every voucher program has pretty much been targeted to special needs kids or to lower income disadvantaged kids. So to date, we really don't have experience with a school choice program that actually serves upper and middle class kids. We only have experience with school voucher programs that serve disadvantaged kids. And whether you're talking about tax credits or vouchers or charter schools, they've a actually come in and serve a niche market, which the most undis underserved kids of all have been disadvantaged kids. The bottom line is, is that we right now have focused school choice on lower income kids. And, you know, we don't think about kids that take vouchers to go to higher education or whose parents have subsidized childcare we don't say, you know, parents will have segregated preschools or segregated colleges. And there's no reason to think that, you know, charter school operators, private schools and public schools that serve school voucher programs, they have an incentive to serve kids, right? So that they get parents to sign up for their schools. And they don't have an incentive to segregate or to discriminate against certain kinds of kids. And so far, there's been no evidence that that will happen, and it hasn't happened. So I think that that's the least of our problems at this point, is worrying about segregation. What we really want to worry about is high-quality schools for all children. Virginia, you want to take a quick 
let me take yeah. yeah and then we'll uh, go to another question a quick stab at yeah. that dc schools um up until recently were 99 percent african-american in the last few years they become about two-thirds african-american and a third latino so were they they were already segregated kids going into voucher programs went to schools where there was incredible diversity mm -hmm. parents have said to us my kids have never been in environments where they were with anything but black kids or latino parents would say my kids have been in schools where they were all latino kids and now my kids are in charter schools or, or um, voucher programs where there are kids from you know all over the cultural spectrum and uh, and so that's cool. That's very cool. So, despite the opposition, whatever they say about we're resegregating, I'm I'm African American from Arkansas. That is not happening. You know, we are getting our kids out of segregated environments. Central High School, where I went to school, and the Little Rock Nine went to school, is all black, just like most urban high schools. So when we, when we have these programs and uh, we, we, we make them available to our children, our kids get um, a lot more diversity then. Uh, so Patrick? that's just a myth. Yeah. <laughs> very, very, I believe the, f the premises of your question are false. Uh, kids today are assigned by zip code when they're in the government schools and in voucher programs there's more diversity as well as how children behave in the schools as measured by do they eat lunch, the tendency to eat in a homogeneous group or not, uh, they're more diverse when they take a voucher and go to private school. So I just respectfully believe the premise of your question is false. All right, let's, and I uh, want to add as a uh, product of Catholic school, I wish that my school had been desegregated so there were more religions than just Catholic. It uh, was monochromatic that way. Let's have uh, another question. I'm uh, John Meserve. I'm a student at George Washington University. And my question is, to what extent you all think tenure is the source or not the source of the problem? Um, there's the famous rubber room article in New Yorker that was really eye-opening. But on the other hand, you know, left-wing people I tend to trust say that, look, other Western European countries have tenure. It's fine, et cetera. Thanks. Thanks. And let me uh, just add something very quickly onto that uh, about tenure in the K through 12 system. Does anybody know what the rationale is for it? I mean, it, there seems to be a clear rationale for academic independence at the university level where you're doing research, but is there a standing argument for why public school teachers should have tenure as an institution? I mean, what does it serve other than job security, which is, you know, okay. Yeah. Tenure is part of the problem. It's more that the way the system works is that in every aspect of managing human capital, it's done very poorly. So on the front end, principals don't have control over hiring teachers that best fit with their schools. On the back end, unless a teacher, you know, and even if a teacher, right, molests a student, um, is violent in the classroom, is abusing substances in the classroom, even in those very severe cases, like in Los Angeles, I think five, I mean, LA Unified has 800 schools. Less than five teachers have been fired in the last five years in LA Unified. So if you think of any other comparable workforce that would let people go for competence issues. So it's just the whole labor management issue. Like principals can't decide that they want two math teachers instead of an assistant principal. I mean, literally they have no control at all over their human capital in the way that every other organization, business, functioning group in America does. So it's a labor issue first and foremost, and tenure just continues to perpetuate the whole idea that a principal, a group of parents would have decision-making power over who teaches their kids. And right now in most places in America, they really have no control over that. It's all by seniority, by who the district tells them they have to take based on the number of years that they've worked there. And then they're protected from ever losing their jobs no matter what they do. Right. Uh, 
Uh, it's Rebecca true that Berkowitz. there's other countries that have you know tenure, but it's a much more rigorous process in order to earn it. You literally have to earn it, and it's based on performance. And many school districts in this country, you just if you don't get in trouble in two years, two years, boop, you get tenure. So. Uh, okay, let's uh, have another question. Yeah, sir. Hi, my name's Greg. Um, I'm a parent of a four-year-old here in D.C. And one of the issues that's come up as we've kind of gone the waiting for Superman route of applying to every school that we think would be uh, safe and, uh, and, and effective for him is just physical space. Um, I don't know if the panel is really here to address a nuts and bolts issue like that, but uh, some of the schools that we're encountering, they have you know, 1,600 applicants for, for 65 slots. Um, that might be a little bit of an exaggeration. I think it was 600, was it 600 for 65 slots at, at one of them? Um, maybe Ms. Huffman might, with, her, with your breadth, might be able to address that directly um, um, as far as how, how different charters are addressing that. And then I just want to say, Mr. Trippi, thank, thanks for putting up with this. This has got to be really hard for you. Okay. Uh, Rebecca, do you want to talk a little bit about the imbalance between uh, demand and supply? Well, it's a sign of demand. And the way that um, the aggressive, uh, proactive school districts are dealing with that is by allowing charter management organizations that have done a kick-ass job at educating kids to replicate. Um, so next week, this rally that we're going to have in Chicago Public Schools, the the majority of these 10 schools are for schools that have that are part of these replicating models that have a track record that represent collectively 7,000 seats. Um, so if CPS votes yes, you know, on these 10 schools, those waiting lists will get, you know, the demand, uh, much of that demand will be met. Um, so I think, you know, charter organizations are in a much better position to meet the demand immediately and the lack of a voucher program. But, you know, um, that, that's, that's a huge imbalance that a lot of school districts are dealing with, could is you, the waiting list. Could you talk a little bit about uh, what, what is the basic political tactic to get, say, the Chicago public school system or Chicago politicians to actually vote yes on expanding the number of charters or voucher programs? I mean, is it just a show of numbers? Is it people being angry? Is it, you know, what works? Uh, well, what has worked in Chicago, and I know what's worked in New York, is having mayoral control. A really ed reform-minded mayor saying, you know, s screw what's best for adults, we're gonna do what's best for kids. And um, really being proactive and going out, like I've seen Minneapolis is going through this right now, Minneapolis Public Schools, where they're actively recruiting charter management organizations from across the country saying, come and start schools in our community. And so, you know, I, I think that the, the whole political piece is so, you can't get around it. You gotta have a mayor that is supportive of school choice and that is gonna appoint these school board members and these school board members are not gonna be afraid of losing their positions. That's what we've seen, you know, has worked. It's Jerry, not always uh, perfect, but it's, it's worked. Did you well. have a uh, quick comment? Well, thank you for y your comment. I, look, I, I really want to be part of having the bigger discussion and to any way that I can facilitate that. I think School Choice Week was a great idea because it helps to foster a, you know, that discussion, what's the best way to do these things. I'm not going to agree, you know, I, I feel pretty strongly that th this whole system's messed up and we can point blame it on everybody, but that's not why, what I'm into. Um, Joe, and, you, uh, you talked I've always about been treated but with respect from folks here, so it's easy to be here, actually. To, to you, you talked uh, in your remarks about, um, you know, uh, inviting uh, teachers' unions or other educational establishment groups to the table. Who, in your opinion, has been the most uh, welcoming or who, who is showing up at the table from the older style power blocks? You know, I don't, I don't really know the answer to that. I'm not, trying to, you know, I, I'm not trying to skirt the question. I just think that, look, there, there's, it's, it does, it's, it's, it's hard to, to get your head wrapped around that change when you're so much part of the way things, things are. And I think, you know, I experienced that a lot um, uh, politically when we tried to change the way politics was done. You know, a whole bunch of people in the Democratic establishment thought you know, we were, we were Martians with tinfoil hats on and that we had to be stopped at all costs. You, you see would that? Uh, be very welcome in this room. Right. Well, and, you know, and, I, and I think a lot of that's happening now 
a lot of times with the Republican establishment, with Tea Party and other people, question what the Republican establishment's doing. So it, it's hard to get the established folks in the system to sort of like come to grips with, hey, we really do need to, to, to look at how we change this. But I think the more that's invited, the better the chance is that we'll actually all come together and find a solution. It, it, it doesn't mean that everybody will come. No one, a lot of people didn't come in the two party establishments and some of them may learn the hard way when the entire party's taken over and changed by the grassroots. But I think the same thing in this issue, the more the grassroots, the more people at home in their neighborhoods decide to participate, to get involved in discussion, the more that forces the top to deal with it. it you're seeing that with these, that's one of the reasons the mayors are, are the, they're the first people have to deal with it. So they're, you're starting to see them open up to, to different ideas, maybe not your solution or my solution, somebody else's, but they're, they're opening up. That's where I think you're seeing the most progress. Uh, Rebecca, very quickly, and then Patrick. One thing we've seen, that the head of the teachers union in Delaware, because of Race at the Top, um, saw that as an opportunity. I think it's, an, it's, it's a mix of, of, of you know, the cross-section of opportunity and just reality. These movies, Waiting for Superman and Cartel, is putting the union and people's on blast. Like, this is ridiculous what's going on. So it's really forced Randy Weingarten and all these head of the teachers union to have to explain themselves to the media saying... <laughs> no, but seriously, um, Randy, have you seen the interviews post Waiting for Superman of, with Randy What she's... The messaging that she's using has completely changed to be a little bit more rational. Um, it, it's so funny living in the neighborhood that I do where the soccer moms are like, I didn't know it was that bad. Like, this is part of the wake-up call of America, is just showing America it's dar dirty laundry, so. Uh, Patrick? There's a biology term, an obligate carnivore. A cat is an obligate carnivore. A dog is a carnivore, but you can actually turn a dog into a vegetarian, if you, and they'll survive and they'll be fine. Cats can't, they're obligate carnivores. It's just, they, they, they die. You cannot make a cat a vegetarian. I'm afraid I think the unions are I obligate. Know. I don't think I like where this is going. Right. I, <laughs> I'm as inclusive as the next guy. I want anyone to come to the table, but you're trying to make a cat. Cats are obligate carnivores, like trying to make a cat a vegetarian. They can't survive as a vegetarian. The, the whole point of the union and the guild is to prevent you from having a choice so they can extract rent. So we can bring them to the conversation. I'd love anyone to show up at the conversation you want, but their whole point in being there is to prevent people from getting a choice. So they're gonna try to slow the conversation down and tell us that we need to go slower and we can't do anything radical and all kinds of things. Their whole point well, is to prevent the choice. Well, uh, under that definition, that's what the establishment and the Democratic Party and the establishment and the Republican Party are about. It's like, just keep it the same do not want any change, because, and you guys in the grassroots are, I mean, that, what I'm saying is, it, but we slowly, yet hopefully, are ch changing the political top. I mean, we have not succeeded by any stretch of the imagination, but I'm saying that I don't, I don't buy that analogy. I, I think, I think that, that, that you the You think the they're dogs and not cats. You can turn yeah, them they into. Can. I think, I think they the want important to thing is that they're animals that need to be domesticated, yeah. though, right? We can yes. agree on that. Uh, Virginia? I, you know, I think that we can all agree that we want everybody to come to the table. What we can't do is force people to come to yeah, the table. Yeah, I agree that. And force people to think the way we think. So it, it's something that a few years ago, when we were debating school choice in D.C., the union wouldn't debate me because I talked about families and kids, and, and Reg Weaver said I made him look bad. And, and I did, <laughs> I did it on purpose, but it, it was like change, and what I said to him was change your conversation. You know, if we're having a discussion about education and you're not talking about doing what's best for the kids, then maybe it's something wrong with you. And so, I mean, I think that we have to stay really clear on bringing everybody to the table, but if they don't come to the table, we still got to fight for these children, yeah. period. Thank you. And uh, Lisa, could you also, you know, one of the uh, uh, questions raised by this uh, conversation is also, like, what is the union, or and is it independent of the teachers? Because I know you've done work on how charter schools and school choice we always talk about it uh, in terms of the children, but in the LA Unified School District and other places, actually teachers are really benefiting from school choice. So uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about how the unions and the teachers are not identical either. So 
Right. Up until just recently, most teachers had to work for districts. They didn't have any kind of work life experiences besides, you know, the system. And what that meant was that in a lot of places like New York City or LA Unified, the contract spells out what time you can be on the campus, you know, how many hours you can devote to students after school. It was very scripted for them what they were allowed to do. So one of the other benefits, right, of all of these kinds of new school choice initiatives, whether it's vouchers or tax credits or virtual schools, is that teachers now have lots of interesting ways to organize their work life. And they know this. And once you have a lot of, you know, younger teachers now, you know, in some ways I'm very hopeful because we have a lot of teachers that are like Teach for America teachers that have grown up under more autonomy, more control, more decision making over their work life. And as they more and more replace older teachers that came up, you know, and again, I'm not trying to discriminate. There's plenty of older teachers that are on board for autonomy and choice and controlling their work life as well. But this has been a huge benefit of school vouchers, tax credits, charter schools, is that like you talk about, Rebecca, with the alumni of kids that have grown up through choice, we have now a huge alumni of teachers. So just to give one example, I am on the board of two virtual charter schools in California that use the K-12 model, the California Virtual Academy in Los Angeles and San Diego. And we now have hundreds of teachers that manage families. So their role is to be a consultant for the family because it's more like a homeschool model where the kids are following a scripted curriculum with a computer at home with their parents. And the teacher is checking in with them, right, about how it's going, looking at their work, but a much different role. And, you know, that job just wasn't available five years ago. There wasn't any such thing. And so... You know, and what we see happening now, though, is a lot of public schools are starting to relax labor rules, at least on the front end. So all of New York City teachers are now sort of in a free market, although the unintended consequence of, of that is that teachers in New York City became free agents, right? But then there became a huge pool of teachers that no principals wanted, right? And so they were on the hook because of the contract with the district. And then that contributed to the rubber rooms because they couldn't find a placement under free agency because nobody wanted to hire them. And so, but what instead, so it became a problem because they freed up the front end of hiring teachers and principals could hire whoever they want. And then they had to kind of take some back because they said, we have to place these teachers. But then that made it all much more transparent in the media to everyone else that there are these people that for whatever reason are undesirable employees that we've basically been warehousing or foisting off on kids for years. And so, you know, all of this has happened on the teaching side as well, just that we have all kinds of great opportunities for teachers and they've become huge fans of school choice because they've experienced firsthand what it means to have autonomy over their work. Thank you very much. And uh, that's going to conclude our uh, panel, but uh, virtually everybody here is going to be hanging around, so let's continue the conversation. There's more uh, booze, there's more food, and there's more uh, people outside as well. So I want to thank uh, Joe Trippi, Patrick Byrne, Rebecca Huffman, Virginia Walden Ford, and Lisa Snell for talking to us, and thanks for coming. <laughs>